Yes, good evening and welcome to Prophetic Insights this evening as we study God's Word together, especially the present truth for these last days. At this time, we are going to begin with a word of prayer and then we will get right into our study that God has prepared for us. At this time, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, be with us now as we study your words. Give us wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Lead and guide us into all truth is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hus and Jerome were united in their lives. They were united in their love for Christ and his truth. They were united in labor mm. and thus they were united in their deaths, yes. specifically martyrdom. As they were led to their places of execution, they went singing on their way, their countenances shining with the love, joy, and peace of Christ, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer and to die for Christ's sake. Well, the same crisis against church and state that Huss and Jerome were up against, God's servants in these last days will have to encounter as well. And if we plan on being faithful, it's a possibility that we may have to suffer the same fate. Now is the time for us to be preparing by earnest personal Bible study seasons of fasting and prayer and aggressive evangelism. If we are unwilling now to live for Christ, if called upon to be martyrs, we're not going to stand and we're certainly not going to die for Christ. But praise God that the contrary is also true, that if we are faithfully day by day living for Christ, if God should call upon us to yield up our lives for his truth, he will impart the strength to do so. We're looking at chapter six of the great controversy, Huss and Jerome. And to me personally, this is one of the most touching chapters in the entire book. I, I love this chapter. It means a lot to me. Let's get right into it. The author, Ellen White, opens up this chapter, Huss and Jerome, by showing us that as the papacy increased in popularity and power worldwide, the word of God was obscured. And for the application, we are letting you know that right now we are seeing signs. The papacy, again, since 1798 when she received her deadly wound, the papacy, even now, is regaining popularity and favorability worldwide, which also shows then God's word is going to be vehemently attacked. And those who present God's present truth, the everlasting gospel of chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse 6 to verse number 12, as they present this everlasting gospel, they are going to find themselves driven into obscurity by the powers that be. Look at this paragraph. This paragraph here on page 97 in the book Great Controversy it says this the gospel had been planted in Bohemia as early as the ninth century the Bible was translated and public worship was conducted in the language of the people but as the power of the Pope increased so the word of God was obscured and now we are seeing the papacy is regaining world dominance again as I said since 1798 there it is on the screen he's gaining favorability gaining popularity getting higher and higher even in Europe as well as in the United States of America so what are we seeing here God's people are soon going to be fine will find themselves driven into obscurity. I keep saying that. Look with me. Chapter 11 of the Revelation. Chapter 11. Revelation. It's coming. As the papacy regained power, so we are seeing God's people are going to be driven into the wilderness, driven, driven into silence, as it were. Chapter 11 of the Revelation. Look with me at verse number, verse number 3. It says this, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. We know the Old and the New Testaments. And they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days 
clothed in sackcloth. And that word sackcloth means obscurity. Right. As she rose in popularity, this will be the simultaneous effect. God's word will be attacked aggressively. Yes. And those who present God's word will also be persecuted. And as we saw in the chapter Huss and Jerome, just in the first paragraph, it shows also that as the papacy rose to power, it says that Pope Gregory the seventh did something very significant. Hillary, what did Pope Gregory uh, do as the papacy rose with power and began to command attention of the world? Well, John Huss was preaching in, Bohem in Bohemia, as the chapter brings out, and he was preaching to the people the truths from the Bible. And as he presented the truths from the Bible, inevitably the errors of Rome were exposed. And so effective was the preaching of John Huss that people began to accept the message and they began to see the papacy in a different light that they hitherto had not seen it. And that evoked the most bitterest ire, you know, from Pope Gregory. And as a result, he issued a ban and nobody, he banned public, public worship. And the application of that is in the last days, we know that as the Sunday law will become a law, the law of the land, as it will be enforced, public worship will be prohibited from those who do not join with the pope, with popery and also those who are preaching against her erroneous agenda. And remember now that we are told in volume five of the testimonies, page 451, that in the United States of America first and then around the world, the principles of our constitution will be repudiated. Every principle. Mm -hmm. Let's read that. Look at this statement here. Here it is. Page 97 of the Great Controversy. This is Pope Gregory VII. Look at those words. It says here, Pope Gregory VII, who had taken it upon himself to humble the pride of kings, was no less intent on enslaving upon enslaving the people. And accordingly, a bull was issued forbidding what? Public worship. To be conducted in the Bohemian tongue. Last sentence, thus Rome decreed that what? That the light of God's word should be extinguished and the people should be shut up in darkness. Look at this. In volume 5, Testimonies, page 451, it says here, In America, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and a Republican government. And in Great Controversy, page 588, we're also told that in the, in the United States of America, they would trample upon our rights of conscience. You know, the First Amendment to the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, guarantees three things, freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom or the right to assemble peaceably. And of course, we see that freedom of speech is under attack. We see that freedom of the press is under attack. Mm -hmm. So uh, inevitably, the third, which is the right to assemble peaceably, will soon be uh, prohibited and under attack. And uh, again, we are seeing that very, very soon, chapter 13 of the Revelation, Verse 15 through verse 17 is about to be fulfilled. So when Pope Gregory banned public worship, it was not for the Catholics. Right. Those who went along with the agenda of popery, but those who were preaching the, the, the principles of truth, they detested. That's right. Their rights were stripped away from them. And it is going to happen again in these last days. And we're seeing a foreshadowing of it in Russia. And we brought the article last week that um, no evangelism can be conducted there. Even in your home, you cannot assemble there uh, for Bible studies. And so we see, as Pastor said, it's not for everybody. It's only those who do not go against Popery's agenda, because we know once the Sunday law is passed, it's going to be a law that it's mandatory to worship on Sunday. So they're going to be conducting their own public worship. But those who decide to worship contrarily to the papacy, they're going to be prevented from worshiping and they're going to incur persecution. Now, notice in this paragraph here in the book, Great Controversy, this chapter, Huss and Jerome, notice carefully that the papacy 
found a compromise. Or let me say it this way. The saints, the professed people of God, found a compromise with the papacy on four points. I want to read those four points. And I want you to see what the papacy did after she agreed with those four points. Because this is showing us that today the papacy cannot be trusted. Right. Pope Francis cannot be trusted. The papacy never could be trusted. And even when the, the popes stand up and say, we are for religious freedom. They are not. It is only words to bring about a union of the churches with the papacy, the nations with the Vatican. And once they have done that, then their true colors will be manifested, which is to persecute any dissenter. That's Look right. at this carefully here, friends. I want to oh, listen, 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 friends. Look at this. This is Great Controversy, page 118. It says this, the papal leaders desiring, Despair. despairing of conquering by force, at last resorted to diplomacy. Does that sound like something today? Yes. Diplomacy? Look at this. A compromise was entered into that while professing to grant to the Bohemians freedom of conscience, really betray them into the power of Rome. The Bohemians had specified four points as the condition of peace with Rome. What were they? Number one, the free preaching of the Bible. Don't forget that. That's freedom, right? right. Number two, the right of the whole church to both the bread and the wine in the communion and the use of the mother tongue in divine worship. Look at number three now. They said, Mr. Papacy, if we are going, going to unite with you, then there must be a separation of church and state. Look at number three. The exclusion of the clergy from all secular offices and authority. Number four. And in cases of crime, the jurisdiction of the civil courts over the clergy and laity alike. And of course, the papal authorities at last, what? Agreed. Agreed. And the compromise was formed. Pause right there. Are these not similar sentiments of the papacy today? We are for freedom of worship. Right. Verbally. That's what they say. But as they did in the time of Huss and Jerome, it's a template of what they would do again in these last days. And also, they reserve the right to interpret those articles according to their definition. It's right there. Last, mm -hmm. last sentence. On this basis, a treaty was entered into. And Rome gained by dissimulation and fraud what she had failed to gain by conflict for placing her own interpretation upon the Hussite articles as upon the Bible, she could, per, she could pervert their meaning to suit her own purposes. This has ever been the uh, way of operating of the papacy. If she could not secure what she wanted by force, the sword, then, the sword, then she would inevitably resort to using deception, the tale, that's and it. that's what we see right here. And, but we want to tell you that John Huss did not form a compromise, although many did. As a matter of fact, I want to read something from the book Great Controversy, the chapter entitled Huss and Jerome. I want to read on page 119. When the majority of the professed saints of God joined this compromise, with the papacy, there was a small group that did not unite in this apparent compromise. And they were called the United Brethren. When I read about this group, the United Brethren, my mind thought about the true remnant Amen. who will not join, an, uh, not join a compromise, not join in an ecumenical alliance, that's the word, alliance, not join in, a, in any party with the papacy. Amen. They are going to be the true remnant of God. The first paragraph, page 119, great controversy, Huss and Jerome. As a matter of fact, it's the last page of the chapter. It says, as their former brethren entering into compact with Rome, imbibe her errors, those who had adhered to the ancient faith, faith 
had formed themselves into a distinct church, taking the name of what? United Brethren. This act drew upon them the, the maledictions from all classes, yet their firmness was unshaken. Praise God. Forced to find refuge in the woods and caves, they still assembled to read God's word and unite in his worship. Amen. These were the faithful few. Yes. And today we are seeing professed Seventh-day Adventists forming an alliance with the papacy. It's disgraceful because in so doing, she's laying aside her distinctive doctrines, her peculiarities. And just as it was, the accusations that were brought against the group called the United Brethren, similar accusations will be brought upon this small group in the last days. Bible-believing Christians who refuse to form any ecumenical alliance with the man of sin today. And friends, as we're, we are addressing Huss, who, who was also in Bohemia, Prague, and so on. Do you know today the papacy has also joined forces with the Hussites? Mm. Look at this here. Troubling. Pope headline. Pope Francis meets with the president of the Czech Republic. Read that for us, Hillary. Relations between Czechs and the Catholic Church have been strained for hundreds of years. One of the factors was undoubtedly the burning of the religious reformer John Huss at the stake 600 years ago. Hmm. Now Pope Francis has spoken of the Catholic Church's need to seek forgiveness for the killing in what some are seeing as the biggest step towards reconciliation so far. The Pope said that Huss is burning at the stake after refusing to recant his alleged heresy was an injury to the church itself and the church should ask forgiveness for it, like all the acts in history when killings had been committed in the name of God. Don't forget that. So now is there a union being formed now? Yes. Have the Hussites returned to the mother church, so-called yes. Roman Catholicism? Listen what this says now. The next paragraph says, Hillary, he, he referred. He referred specifically to the 30 years wars, which in particular devastated the Czech lands and much of the rest of Europe in the 17th Skip century. Skip one down. Red words. Okay. That is to... What he said. What he said was very significant. Well, he says this. For me, what the Pope said resonated a lot. What he said was very significant in that he described this as something which hurt a family. Hmm. That is to say that he regards different Christian denominations as part of one bigger family. And this was an injury to that family. I would say this is a very important perspective in that it sees Christians as what? As one family. Pastor... As you read that, I may take your point, but as you read that, Go ahead. who is the mother of this family and who is her daughters? You know, they just stopped short of declaring themselves mother to be Church. the mother. And we know what Revelation 17 calls this entity, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And we know all the churches that join with her and that imbibe her errors, they are her daughters. So now we're seeing here, unfortunately, that the Hussites are joining. But, you know, as you read this, the three previous chapters, we just uh, finished John Wycliffe and before that, the Waldenses. And we showed last week how um, the Church of England, which came out of John Wycliffe, are uniting with the papacy yes, saying we need to home. yeah we need to ask forgiveness for reformation split and we need to join with them we saw the same with the Waldenses we saw Pope Francis meeting with the Waldenses yes. so every chapter we see Pope Francis is trying to conquer these groups that so vehemently opposed him and during, and came out and came out so he's bringing them back in one by one Yep, bringing the daughters back. But home. notice, as he's asking for forgiveness, as Pope Francis is apologizing to the descendants of John Huss, the movement, look what we are told in the book, The Great Controversy, page 571. The Roman church now presents a fear front to the world, mm -hmm. covering with apologies her record 
of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now ready to honor is the same that ruled the world. In the days of the Reformation, when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. Hmm. Let's get back to John Huss. And now the next paragraph shows us John Huss's mother brought him to Prague. She knelt down, we are told, on page number 98, paragraph 1, and she prayed over her son. She was going to send him to school in Prague. Now, what did, Hillary, what did the mother of, of John Huss not realize what she was preparing her son to do? Well, though she was a faithful mother and taught him the Bible and instilled in him godly principles, she did not know that the message that he would preach as a preacher would bring him before the courts. And not only that, she did not realize, again, the mother of John Huss did not realize that not only would he preach Bible truth, but the preaching of that truth would have caused John Huss to be brought to the courts, be condemned at the judgment seat of men. That same truth which he would preach would cause him to be imprisoned. Yes. That same truth of God's word would cause him to die a martyr at the stake. And neither did she realize the extent of his influence. Upon other reformers. Correct. And the question is, my friend, the question is, what are we as parents preparing our children to do in these last days? Are we preparing our nieces our nephews, our children, to be God's messengers in these last days, even to be a martyr if God wills? Hmm. Are we preparing ourselves to live for God or to die a martyr for him? Friends, let me just say this. If we were to get one theme that encapsulate this chapter in the book, Great Controversy, Huss and Jerome, the chapter, that one theme would be martyrdom. Right. And what we're going to see is that in these last days, once that Sunday law is enforced, there are going to be martyrs. That's right. And it's unfortunate that as you mentioned, you know, you asked the question, what are parents, you know, preparing their children to do? A lot of them are preparing them to go into corporate America, make a lot of money, you know, get a nice house, so on and so forth. Live the American dream or wherever you're from, live that dream and just enjoy what the world has to offer. If, if parents today really believe that martyrdom is coming for some of God's people, a great crisis is coming for some of God's people, even for children. Yes. They would not allow their children to watch certain movies, certain things on the Internet. Electronics, to, video games. To get caught up in electronic devices, to get wrapped up in worldly music. If they really believed that a martyr's fate would be the lot of their children. They would not allow their children to sit down there every week and read books from infidel authors, worldly stories with colorful, pretty words, poetic words in the Sabbath school lesson guide. If they really believed that their children may one day be martyrs, for the truth of Christ, they would not allow them to be placed in certain churches. Or schools. Even schools, mm -hmm. if they really believed. You know, I was in the office, Hillary, a few, I think it was yesterday, and listening to Christian on the, the, um, in, in Remnant Prep and how the, the instructor uh, was driving home to them the importance of memorizing scripture. Just as I'm reading this, John Huss's mother did not even know 
that that child would be a martyr for Christ. Right. But the best that she knew, she put in his mind. That's right. And what a tree was grown, Amen. had grown and blossomed. What fruit was born on the tree of John Huss. And I said to myself right now, what are most of Seventh-day Adventist children doing in some of these schools? What are they doing in some of these so-called Christian schools? Worldliness. And yet they say, yes, we believe we're living in the last days. Their actions do not show that they believe they might be martyrs for the sake. Their children, their nieces, their nephews may be martyrs for this everlasting gospel. Look at this carefully, my friends. Look at this carefully. This is uh, Selected Messages, book three, page 397. Read that for us. The two armies, Hillary. The two armies will stand distinct and separate, and this distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convinced of truth will come on the side of God's commandment keeping people. When this grand work is to take place in the battle, prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned. All right. Many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth. So will there be martyrs in the last days? Yes, there will be. And that's why we must focus on this chapter, Huss and Jerome, volume five, testimonies for the church. Page 81, it says this, the time is not far distant. When the test will come to every soul, the mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision insult threatened imprisonment and what and death. death so when the mark of the beast is in force sh will there be martyrs yes shortly thereafter there will be martyrs look at this next statement in the book early writings we are told even children some of them are going to be martyrs look at this wow. it says this page 18 as we were traveling along we met a company who also were gazing at the glories of the place. I noticed red as a border on their garments. Hillary, read on. Their crowns were brilliant. Their robes were pure white. As we greeted them, I asked Jesus who they were. He said they were martyrs that had been slain for him. So what, what was on the border of their garments? Red. Red. Read on. Um, he said with the, he said they were martyrs that had been slain for him with them was an innumerable company of little ones they, they also had a hem of, of red, red on their garments children are going to be martyrs yes you know it's interesting as i read that my mind went back to numbers chapter 15 because god told the israelites to place something on the hem the border of their garments. What was that? A ribbon, a ribbon of, blue. of blue. And what does blue represent in Numbers 15, verse 37 through verse 40? The law. When they see the ribbon of blue, that they will remember to obey his commandments. Amen. Do them. Leave the world of sin alone. So notice now, as the people of God, parents, adults, children little ones as they stand for god ribbon of blue on their garment yes. many of them will be martyrs, martyrs the ribbon of red yes on their garments blue and red wow. oh my friends so no ribbon of red if there's no ribbon of blue that's it yeah we have to keep the that's law it. if we plan on being you know faithful during this crisis and again the question is as parents as pastors, as teachers, let me say this, if the professors in our schools really believe this may be the lot of many young Seventh-day Adventists, the millennials, the young people, what would they teach in these schools? They would teach their children, as did the Waldensian parents, because the Waldensies, as we read last week, they, that's what they prepared their children for. They if the pastors believe it, what would they preach from the pulpits? The three angels' messages 
along with the righteousness by faith message, which is a part of the three angels. Now, again, once the mark of the beast is enforced, as God's people stand for truth, there'll be martyrs. Not as it was uh, between 538 and 1798, but there are going to be martyrs, a few. Notice now. But when Jacob's time of trouble comes, when Christ stands up and probation closes, no more martyrs. Look at this hmm. statement here. This is early writings, page 284, paragraph 1. I won't read all of this. Look at this. It says, it was an hour of fearful, terrible agony to whom? The saints. the saints. Day and night, they cried unto God for deliverance. Skip on down, blue words. It says, but the saints heeded them not. Like whom? Like Jacob, Jacob. they were wrestling with God. So what time period is this? Jacob's, Jacob's time, of, time trouble. of trouble, which starts when Michael stands up. When probation closes, all right, notice now, red words, I saw that if the wicked were permitted to slay the saints, Satan, and all his evil host, and all who hate God would be gratified. That means in the time of Jacob's trouble, no martyrs. One more statement, great controversy, page three, page 600. And 34, it says, just, just zoom in on those red words. It says, if the blood of Christ's faithful witnesses were shed at this time, what time is this? We shall see. Mm -hmm. At this time, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, be a seed sown to yield a harvest for God. This chapter on page 634 is entitled, God's People Delivered. Delivered. No martyrs at this time. Jacob's time of trouble. Look at the scripture that Sister White quotes now. She says, If the righteous were now left to fall a prey to their enemies, it would be a triumph for whom? The, the devil. Then she says, says the psalmist, in the time of trouble. All right. He shall hide me in his pavilion. So at this time, no martyrs. And you see why? Because if probation is closed, their blood would not be a seed. There's no more decision making. Every person has made their uh, final decision. They're either sealed for God or they're seared for damnation. And so we can see why. That doesn't mean they're not going to try, though, because it's during that time when the death decree goes forth. Amen. Now, as we are studying here, Huss and Jerome, whose writings, Hitler, whose writings led and laid the foundation to the ministry of reform carried forward by Huss and Jerome. It was the writings of John Wycliffe. So we go backward. Mm -hmm. How John Wycliffe laid that solid foundation. Correct. Look at this, my friends. Look at this. It says here on page 99, paragraph 2, a citizen of Prague, Jerome, who afterward became so closely associated with, with Huss, had on returning from England brought with him the writings of Wycliffe. Wycliffe. It was Wycliffe's teachings that laid that foundation for Huss and Jerome to carry forward their work of reformation. And what we are now seeing is the writings of the Bible, the writings of Ellen White that must lay the foundation for revival and reformation in the churches and the nations of our world. And not only in general, Sister White's writings, mm -hmm. but specifically this book, The Great Controversy. Right. And as you mentioned, um, revival and reformation in the, in the churches and in the nation, well, it has to start on a personal level. We need revival. We need reformation. And it begins with the Word of God. It begins with the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, specifically the great controversy because the writings of the spirit of prophecy constantly lead back to the scriptures, as she says in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. And so John Wycliffe's writings, they were not apart or separate from the teachings of scripture. They made plain, they expounded upon the scripture. And because the people were in such darkness, they could not appreciate the scriptures as it was given. So they needed the writings of John Wycliffe. And so it is. And so it is what? So it is today. With the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That's it. Mm -hmm. How Sister White gives that inspired commentary. Not to supersede the scriptures. Same inspiration. 
to bring light, to expel darkness, and to liberate people, churches, and nations from the deceptions of the papacy. Correct. And to bring them out from her grasp and send them forward to now preach the gospel to a dying world. Amen. Notice now, friends, as I began to go through this chapter, Huss and Jerome, Sister White says something impressed the mind of Huss and led him to study God's word and the writings of Wycliffe even deeper. What was that, Hillary? Well, there were two men from England that came to Prague and they were preaching the word of God. And of course, as a result, uh, they were preaching the truths and they were exposing the sins and the abominations of the papacy. So they were prohibited. They were silenced. Their, their method of, of reaching souls was silenced. And so they had to figure out a way to get the attention of the people. So they were also artists. And so what they did, they made two paintings, two specific paintings. On one hand, they had a beautiful painting of Christ riding in Jerusalem uh, on a donkey in his humble, travel-worn garments with his lowly disciples without, with naked feet, you know, riding into Jerusalem. While on the other side, contrasted with that picture of Christ on the donkey, there was a picture of a pontifical uh, procession, magnificent. The, you had the Pope with this glorious crown on his head, uh, arrayed in beautiful, uh, majestic garments, trumpeters going before him, going behind him, a big procession of people. And that contrast arrested the attention of John Huss, and not just John Huss, but everyone that saw it. They could see what sermon was being preached there. If these were truly the followers of Jesus, why did they not reflect his humility. Why did not they not reflect the image, the picture of Christ? And that made such an indelible impression upon John Huss. So was there a contrast made? Oh, absolutely. So notice on the screen, what Hillary brought forward was on, can be found on page 99, paragraph 3. Later on in his life, while John Huss was about to be burnt at the stake, John Huss received a vision, a dream. And he was replaying how he began in the ministry. And this was a scene that Christ brought back to John Huss's mind. And John Huss gives now the application, a more startling application. Look at this here. This is page 108, paragraph 1. It says, in the gloom of his dungeon, he foresaw the triumph of the true faith. Returning in his dreams to the chapel at Prague, where he had preached the gospel, he saw the Pope and his bishops effacing wow. the pictures of Christ, which he had painted on its walls. Pause. So what did John Huss see? He in saw the bishops of Rome erasing the picture of Christ. So what were they erasing, though? His character, his message his ministry, his truths. And the contrast that was made by the two pictures. The contrast. They wanted to remove the contrast. Get wow. back here. This vision, said Huss, distressed me. But on the next day, he saw many painters now occupied in restoring these figures in greater number and in brighter colors. Amen. Oh, my friends. Mm. The first sentence says, in the gloom of his dungeon, he foresaw the triumph of what? The, of the true, true faith. faith. Hear me, friends. So now, if we are going to fulfill this, God needs some modern-day spiritual painters Amen. to be occupied in showing the people that there is a difference between Christ's teachings and the teachings of the Pope. And it says painting them on a wall, That's it. a wall of separation That's it. between us and the papacy. Yes. And in this application, the wall now points to anything that we can use in the public market square. As long as God's word uh, uh, justifies it, um, sanctions it, use it to make a distinction between popery. And what truth is. Amen. And the word now also points to a person's mind, heart. Get back to the screen. He says afterwards, 
brighter colors. As soon as their task was ended, the painters who were surrounded by an immense crowd exclaimed, now let the popes and bishops come. Hmm. They shall never efface them more. Oh, said the reformer, as he what now? Related his dream. I maintain this for certain, that the image of Christ will never be effaced. They have wished to destroy it, but it shall be painted afresh. Where? In all, In hearts. all hearts. By much better preachers than myself. Wow. He was foretelling his role and the role of the reformers that would come after him. As it were, he was the first painter, as it were. But in the last days, many more painters yes. to make a distinction between Christ and the papacy. And Sister White says that this work is going to close more gloriously than it first, you know, opened Greater up number, with. he says, and in brighter Color. colors, Amen. a more glorious work than how it began. Amen. So now today, how do men efface Christ's image? Now, I mean, we could talk about this in the world. Oh, absolutely. Because God's image brings us back to the Ten Commandments, His law, His character. Mm -hmm. So when we see uh, professed Seventh-day Adventists, preachers and professors uniting with the papacy, quoting from Jesuits in our Sabbath school lesson guide, they are removing the contrast. That's right. The difference between truth and error, between God's true movement and an apostate, Jezebel-like, abominable church. But didn't we see that this started long before because we saw this even in 1957. That's it. With um, Seventh-day Adventists. 55 through 57. Yeah, yes. Answer questions on doctrine where they put out this, uh, this book, this paper, stating that we're a part of the um, evangelicals. We don't believe in a heavenly sanctuary, they said. We're not a cult. And so they renounced some key They renounced pillars. Christ's nature. Nature. That right. he had the nature of, of Adam, Adam after. Be no, no. Before the fall, that his nature, mistake, I know, that his nature was before the fall. Right. That is heresy. Yes. And it's certainly unbiblical, contrary to scripture. All right. So now that teaching comes from Rome, right. immaculate conception, the virgin. Right. So what she had, she gave to Christ. And that there's no 1844, you know, there's oh no God. Hebrews, you know, Hebrews 8 and 9. Are, All right. Well, even today. So now when we see this Ganondia, look at that statement right there. It says here, it is a backsliding church, bottom left. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Well, was it not uh, someone wrote an article in the Adventist Review saying we have no beef with Pope Francis and went on to show how uh, our stance with health reform unites with Pope Francis as it relates to climate change? You know, and you see it, the statement that we read um, regarding the painters, it said they wanted to efface the image of God. Yes. And we know that the image of God, God created male and female, created he them, and he created them in his image. So when we see the LGBT movement within Seventh-day Adventists, that's a Adventism. That's another way we see that Christ's image is being defaced. And the Desire of Ages says that before Christ's first advent, advent, Satan exulted. He rejoiced that he had been successful in effacing the image of God in man. And when Seventh-day Adventists stand up and are, are saying that Adam and Steve is sanctioned, you know, we're basically doing the same thing, effacing the image of God and, and that, holding and, councils amen, and amen, symposiums amen, and trying to justify amen. these types of lifestyles. And not only lifestyle. Adventists with the, with the papacy, but Seventh-day Adventists uniting with the daughters of Popery. Right. It's, it's, it's erasing the image of God. Erasing the distinction when we were cut out from the world in 1844. So you're basically renouncing the whole movement. You're renouncing 1844. You're renouncing the three angels, the second angel specifically. So we are the modern day painters. painters. Where God says in 1 Peter chapter, 1 Peter 
chapter 2 and verse 9, for ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, royal priesthood, holy, a nation, holy nation, peculiar to people. a peculiar people. That's the word, a peculiar people. That means there must be a difference Amen. between us and the world, a peculiar people who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. So now when we have singers from Babylon brought into our churches and their music, what are we doing? We are removing the image of God, the contrast that must be seen between what is truth and what is error. And it's interesting that when these singers are brought in, uh, they call it a week of revival. So they're having programs that they're calling revival and reformation. And the ministers that they are bringing in are people from Babylon. How are you going to be revived? How, are, how is there going to be a reformation with the men of Babylon? Let's Cannot move on. Huss and Jerome on page 102. We read that Huss had a struggle in his mind. What was that struggle? Well, he was conflicted and um, he basically believed, he still believed, you know, uh, that the Roman Catholic Church was still God's church. But the conflict came in because he said, if this is the true church, why do I feel so compelled to disobey it? You what a know? struggle. Why such corruptions if this is God's true church? And notice he's saying, wait a minute, all these policies, all these teachings, from the popes and bishops. Why do I feel compelled to disobey if this is the true church? Hmm. And, the, and we are told on page one, 102, paragraph one of the great controversy that he finally solved the struggle in his mind. And what caused this? He said, I remember Christ had raised up the Jewish church, but the Pharisees, and the scribes had brought in the traditions of men, paganistic teachings that corrupted the Jewish church. And then he said, okay, I saw now how when Christ came, John the Baptist and the apostles, instead of preaching the traditions of men, they preached Preach. the word of God. Amen. Then he said, okay, I know what I must do now is to preach the word of God. And tell the individuals not to follow the teachings and the false policies of the church. That's right. And that brings us back to the paintings. The distinction as he taught the word of God, the marked contrast was seen in, in what the um, word of God was, the truth was, and what the teachings of man were because they led away from the scriptures. Look at the screen here. GC 102 paragraph 1. Please note this paragraph and please read this paragraph carefully. There is, is an application here, not only for those in the world, because we realize that none of us would ever say any church in Babylon is God's true church. They've already fallen. They've yeah. been in a fallen yeah. state since 1844. And the, the, the papacy has been in a fallen state before 1844. Amen. All right. But now notice now. We're looking at an application within Seventh-day Adventism. Because as Seventh-day Adventists, I get the phone calls. I get the emails. I get the letters. People are saying, what is happening in my mind? Why do I feel the struggle? If this is God's true church, why do I feel compelled to disobey these teachings, these doctrines? We must bring them back to page 102, paragraph 1 in the book, Great Controversy, as one clear solution. Mm -hmm. What we must understand is that men have crept in as professors, as pastors, as administrators, and they're leading God's movement astray. So what must we do like Christ, like John the Baptist, like the disciples, like us? What must we do? We must preach the word of God. We must expose the man-made traditions that have come into Seventh-day Adventism. We must tell the people, do not obey those policies that come down from your local conference, That's right. from your union, from your division, from the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. While it is God's end-time movement, 
most of the policies are against God. Against scripture. And we need to resolve ourselves and also teach men not to sit up under apostasy. Notice, when they voted in the year 2005 at a general conference stating, stating that Sister White can enrich but no longer define our faith and practice. Wow. That would cause anyone to have a natural struggle mentally oh, yeah. who loved the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. And Are you saying mm -hmm. that this cannot define our, our faith, faith and, and practice. practice? Then why do we need it? Correct. It's optional then. And even in 2015, when they voted again, that she's no longer the messenger of the Lord and that she's not, not an authoritative source. That's it. And in that same 2015, Hillary, they voted also stating that the, uh, the Bible was written by holy inspired author. authors. That's not what First no Peter, uh, uh, Second Peter, chapter one, verse nineteen, 21. verse twenty and twenty-one say, "Holy men of God." Amen. Men of God. Holy men of God speak as they're removed by the Holy Ghost. So why would they take out the word ho the words holy men and put inspired authors? push forward the agenda of women's ordination, which if it would have been voted because this was the third time, 2015 was the third time that it was actually brought to, brought to a general conference session to be voted upon. If it would have been voted and carried, we would be seeing the ordination of women, pastors and elders. So how could you sit today? in those churches where the, the North American leaders say, well, we can ordain them now. However, we are going to make sure that we hire more women as pastors and allow them to have, have the same duties as their male counterpart in ministry only for one or two things, but give them the same duty and the same pay. Right. How can you sit under a woman pastor who is baptizing, marrying, in no wonder now you see in Chico Seventh-day Adventist Church a woman baptizing a known uh, lesbian. Right. You're seeing what's happening here. And you here. see a transgender elder in California. You're seeing what's happening here. Oh. How could we sit under this? It will cause any person to have a mental struggle. And even um, with the celebration movement, and we've heard many people say that they go to a particular church or particular churches rather and when the music when the praise team comes up and they're doing the drums and having the that kind of music the worldly music in the church they say they just get up they go somewhere and pray and then when that session is over they go back in to listen to the sermon but when sister white tells us that under that music the senses of rational beings would become so confused that they cannot even know what is truth so what kind of message is going to be presented after that kind of calf worship environment. And that's found in Selected Messages, book two, page 36 through page 38. Right, so they see the problem, but they're, they're struggling. Isn't that's this God's church? It. It's called Seventh-day Adventism. So we you know? are the modern day us. We're the painters. We are they. And now they're saying it's okay for a man or a husband or and or a wife to wear a wedding band and they state that ring. in the church manual and that they can also that a husband and a wife can also um get divorced because of irreconcilable differences when the bible does not sanction that notice here all. friends notice so what must we do like us preach god's word what must we do we must let the people realize don't sit under apostasy do not do it do not do it don't do it you must, not, you must not support apostasy. Don't do it. When the leaders are leading God's people astray. Now, friends, let's move on. On page 104, paragraph 3, in the chapter Huss and Jerome, we read that there was, a there was a special, there was a significant council that was called at a place called Constance. Mm -hmm. Don't miss this. In this council, two primary objectives were brought forward. Number one, in the council at Constance, they were to heal the schism in the church. Don't forget that. Put it down. Heal the schism in the church. And number two, they were now to identify and to root out heresy. Hmm. Root out the heretics. Look at this carefully here. Page 104, paragraph 3. 
Hillary. It says here, the chief objects to be accomplished by the council at Constance were to hear the schism in the church and what else? And to root out heresy. When I read that, I said, Lord, what could this mean? Firstly, I put down on my paper in my office on my table there, I wrote down Constance. I said, wait, where's Constance, by the way? And I Googled it. Constance is in Germany today. Constance. So there was a council. Let's prove that. There it is right there on the screen. This is from uh, the word map. That map, the green icon, center bottom. It says here, you don't shop on Saturday if you live in Constance, Germany. A 1,400-year-old city of eight to 3,000 people where the Rhine. Don't forget that word Rhine. Because that was where the ashes of John Huss, right. the ashes of Jerome were thrown after they were burnt at the stake. Constance, Germany. Wait a minute now. So in Constance, Germany, a council was held. What was number one again? To heal the, the schism, schism in the church. In the church. Mm -hmm. I said, Lord, Constance in Germany? That was in the day of Huss and Jerome. Is there any meeting going on right now in Germany to heal a schism? Yes, there is. In the churches? Yes. What schism is now being healed here? What well, schism? Between, schism? Between who? Between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants. Pro October 31st, 2017. And of course, we've heard, we've all heard Sweden, Sweden, but it's, there's going to be commemorations and councils in Germany as well. Hold that point. Let's confirm that. Look at this, my friend. March 1st, 2017. What is your headline there? National Catholic Reporter. 500 years after what? Reformation. And the schism! Exclamation sign. Wow. Do you see it now, yeah. friends? Huss and Jerome. And guess what? If somebody tells you that the book Great Hope takes the place of the complete great controversy, run from those people, my friends. Yes. Because in the Great Hope, there's no chapter called Huss and Jerome. You would not have read that in Constance, there was a council called to hear the schism in the church. In other words, to bring back those who were once dissenters of popery to come back under Roman Catholicism wow. is a schism being healed right now. Yes, it is. Notice now we're in Germany, in Germany today as it was in the days of Huss and Jerome. Look at this, my friends. Look at this. This is October 29th, The Guardian, 2016. A headline reads, after what now, Hillary? After 500 years of schism, will the rift of the Reformation finally be healed? What does the Bible tell us? What's the answer? Yes, it's going to be the healed. The deadly wound in Revelation 13. Verse, verse 3, verse 4, verse, verse 11, all the way down through verse 18. Look at this now. This is in 2017, October 31st, when Pope Francis, along with the so-called evangelical and so-called Protestants, was signed officially that letter. Stating the reformation, the schism is what now? Is over. over. We're all now one church. We're one body. One family. One family. Ah, you got it now. Amen. Look at this now, friends. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, friends. You know what? Uh, wait a minute there. I'm going to pull this out. My sermon notes here. I want to read this. I want to give you the actual words to go look it up. If you go on Google, type in ecumenicalnews.com, ecumenicalnews.com, and type in the words October 31st, 2017, and the word Wittenberg. Again, Wittenberg, October 31st, 2017, and go to ecumenicalnews.com. It tells you in Germany again, October 31st, 2017 that there is going to be an actual significant ceremony, ceremony. Mm -hmm. council there the signing stating the schism the reformation is over that's wow. why on the screen you have there my friend council at constance 
He is the schism number one. What's number two? Root out heresy. Root out heresy. Then we have the application now. October 31st, 2017, in Germany. Constance, Germany. In Germany, it says now, once the deadly wound is about to be completely healed. What will be the next step? To identify and what? And to root out heretics, heretics. and those they call heretics and heresy root out go with me chapter 7 of daniel where are we going to my friends go there with me daniel 7 root out root out i wonder how did they identify who were the heretics well those who refused to unite with them on those four points that they had mentioned and so it will be on october 31st 2017 any group that does not unite in this ecumenical body, they are the dissenters, and they are the ones to be rooted out. And those who are preaching and exposing the apostasies of popery. Look right. at this. You know what? Let's read this, and then we come back to chapter 7 of Daniel. Go with me. GC 113 on the screen. Notice how they described Hus and Jerome. Well, since we're here, chapter 7, Daniel. In verse number seven, it mentions the fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Verse number eight mentions the little horn, which is the papacy. Then it says, I consider the horns. And behold, there came up among them another what now? Little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the, by the roots. Mm -hmm. Once the schism was healed, in the days of Hus and Jerome, the next step was to identify who were the heretics who were preaching so-called heresy and root them out. Right. So what we're saying here, listen to me carefully. Father in heaven, oh dear God, give us understanding. Give us eyes that we may see. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. What we're saying here, once October 31st, 2017 comes around and the papacy and her daughters are now brought back together in one so-called happy family. Mm -hmm. The next step is they are going to begin to identify who heretics are. Right. And describe what heresy is and say, now we must rid them, root them up, root them out. If you go back to the type you'll understand what will happen shortly. Do you see how close we are to the end, my friends? Do we see how close we are to the coming martyrdom, persecution, imprisonment of God's faithful people, yet we're here talking about what's happening in the, N in the NBA? What's happening on um, late night television? The comedians who are joking about Trump? My friends, may God rid these things out of our minds. Amen. What's the latest movie in Hollywood? What's the newest book? Uh, come on, friends. Probation's hour is about to close. Mortadom, persecution are coming. Am I ready? Are you ready? It says, GC 113, Hillary, pointing. Pointing to his judges, he said firmly, you condemned Wycliffe and John Huss, not for having shaken the doctrine of the church, but simply because they branded with reprobation the scandals proceeding from the clergy, their pomp, their pride, and all the vices of the prelates and priests. The things which they have affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also think and declare like them. His words were interrupted. The prelates, trembling with rage, cried out, what need is there of further proof? We behold with our own eyes the most stubborn, okay, the most obstinate of heretics. So why did they call John Huss, John Wycliffe, and Jerome heretics? They were exposing the abominations of Roman Catholicism. May I go here now? Yes. Great controversy. Page 606. I won't read this. Just note, note, note the paragraph. 606 great controversy it says on page 606 bottom second paragraph it says it says the laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of god's spirit 
than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon, Babylon will be laid open. Will be laid open. And when she said, oh my friends. So now those who proclaim the three angels' messages. That's right. And that's why I want to say it's very dangerous. It's sinful when Seventh Day, professed Seventh-day Adventists will sit there and say they don't know who the Antichrist is. We read a statement from Signs of the Times that said it's a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and, and Rome. It's, it's sinful when we see men saying that the three angels message is irrelevant or that the great controversy needs to be relegated to the historical trash heap. It's sinful. It's, it's blasphemy. And that is exactly why, because you've thrown away Revelation 14 and you've thrown away the great controversy and the spirit of prophecy, that's why you can join in these ecumenical movements. That's why you can join with the UN. These are the very persecutors. Those are the ones that will restrict civil and religious liberty from you. Hold on. In, in, the, in the account of John Haas, there was a civil leader, a king named Sigismund. And he had, get, watch carefully. He had given uh, John Haas uh, freedom to go to Prague. Uh, A to safe conduct. Safe conduct. Mm -hmm. Safe conduct. So watch, watch the application. So John Haas received safe conduct. That liberty. means he has liberty. Mm -hmm. Do not restrict his liberty. Do not arrest him. Do not Yet, try to kill him. When John Haas was brought before the courts, Sigismund, Sigismund, is standing there in the court, the very court that condemned John Huss to the state, showing even the civil power bowed to the power of the church. Wow. So now here is the application. America, Britain, Canada, Jamaica, you name it, the UN, different countries, they may not guarantee you liberties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But once they come under the dominion of popery, those liberties will be repudiated and they will sit there saying, I can't help you. And you know what? Is it, didn't you just show an article this past, uh, not this past Sabbath, this past Thursday and the Sabbath prior that uh, the European Union just declared Pope Francis as their head. So there Is it we coming? see it. it so friends, coming. what I'm saying here, what we see once the meeting in Constance, he the schism in the church. The next step was to identify heretics and root them out. There is a biblical precedent for this. Look with me at Luke 23. Go there with me. Luke 23. It says here, do you remember a man called Herod? And a man called Pilate? Look at verse 12. And notice, once Herod and Pilate healed their schism. Yes. They identified Christ as a heretic. Once they hear their differences, the next step was that they identified Christ uh, as a, a heretic and they signed his death warrant, as it were, his crucifixion. That's Luke 23, verse 12. And the same day whom? Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For before they were at enmity between themselves wow. and if you read down to verse 25 it says now then they said let's crucify him hmm. was there a schism healed yes. between god's professed people and the roman power next step identify crucify him so it was in the days of Hus and jerome and what we're saying is october 31st 2017 Shortly thereafter will be persecution for God's people. Right. So since we have come to a repetition, a repetition of the council at Constance, Hus time period, our time period, that means the experience of John Hus must be ours. Amen. Must be ours. And notice, the next paragraph in JC, when they brought John Huss to the stake, about to burn him alive. I mean, can you imagine? To burn a man alive. Now, you get burned, I mean, hot water, you're cooking, and hot water uh, burn your hand. How do you feel? 
It's not to a burn feeling. someone alive? Notice, where was John Huss's mind when they were about to burn him? Because his experience, my friends, must be ours. His Hillary. mind was not upon self. His mind was upon Christ and how Christ had suffered for his sake so that he could have the opportunity to be saved. And he said to himself, if Christ was willing to suffer this and even more than what I'm suffering, who am I, you know, to shy away yes. or try to avert yes. death? His mind was constantly upon Christ throughout the entire situation. Friends, when you look at the screen, page 108, paragraph four, I won't read all of this. You have read the chapter. John Huss, when they placed that um, um, ill-shaped mitre of paper on his head. Right. With, with insults With and the words, you know, arch heretic. heretic. And pictures of demons on it. John Huss's mind <clears throat> was not on his persecutors. No. His mind was not even on the shame, the embarrassment, the public shame. His mind was on Jesus. That Christ wore a crown of, of thorn, a crown of shame for him, John Ross. And since Christ did that for him, he was willing to endure that shame for Jesus. Amen. And this hit me, friends. In that book, The Desire of Ages, page 8 to 3, it says, and here's the application, not until we're having personal devotion every morning, not until we focus daily on the sacrifice of Christ, what Christ gave up for us, so we can have salvation. Will we ever receive the strength to give up all for him when we are found in a similar condition? It says in the next paragraph, page 109, paragraph 2, look at the screen. When they asked John, uh, uh, John Haas, Recant of your errors. They gave him one final opportunity. He said, recant? Hmm. Recant of what? what? Errors. Do you know what came to my mind? Mm -hmm. The experience of the three Hebrews. Yes. When the fire was made seven times, times harder. harder. And here, come the king, here came the king now. Hmm. Nebuchadnezzar. Will you bow? Giving them one more chance. One more chance. Will you recant? They said, the God that we serve. Amen. Amen. The God that we serve. Because those three Hebrews, they had a rich experience with God. Yes. As a result, they could stand in that crisis. So here we are talking about the coming martyrdom. If we don't have a personal walk with God daily, we're not going to stand then. Because none of us know when that day is going to come. And when they lit the faggots under John Huss's feet, and the fire began to blaze. What words came from the man's mouth, Hillary? He was singing. He was singing, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, you think about that. Wow. That means then, if we are going to do it then, what must we be singing now? John Huss did not learn that song that day. Mm -hmm. That was a song he was singing before. And it wasn't just a song. It was an experience. experience. An experience. And what God showed me was that John Huss put this on your paper. Don't you miss this. Father in heaven, help us never to forget this point. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. John Huss being persecuted, being a martyr, being burnt at the stake. His mind was on Christ. That gave them strength to endure that fire. John Huss typified, or John Huss reflected the experience of Stephen. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. Mm -hmm. Who was John Huss? He was the first uh, of the prominent reformers to be martyred. The first? Yeah. The what, first. A, what a connection. The first Christian martyr was Stephen. John Huss, the first martyr of the prominent reformers. Yes. And when they were... Uh, uh, about to, and when they stoned Stephen, where was Stephen's mind? His, his eyes were steadfastly up into the heavens, and he saw Christ standing on the right hand of his father. Do you think that was when Stephen learned to look up? 
while being persecuted? No. No. So his experience was Before manifested while in the crisis. Mm -hmm. So now, friends, if we can look to Christ when we are being persecuted, when people throw black balls at us, when folks malign our characters, when folks betray us, malice us, when are we going to stand? We will never stand there. And Sister White says, let us not think that a self-denying patriotic spirit is going to be uh, developed, developed in a moment. In a no. moment. No. It would never happen. This must be our experience now. And my question is, who persecuted Stephen? It was his, his own, own people. His own people. And who burned John Haas at the stake? Professed brethren. And listen, hear me carefully. It's going to happen again. Look at the statement here, my friends. Look at the statement. Let's pass this. It says here in the book, Prophets and Kings, page 588. Hillary, Zechariah's vision. Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the great day of atonement. The remnant church will then be brought into great trial and distress. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will feel the ire of the dragon and his hosts. Those who are true to God will be menaced. menaced. What does menace mean? Sought for, hunted down. Menaced, what else? They will be denounced, proscribed. They will be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk, folks and friends, even, even unto, unto the death. death. Luke 21, 6. And we're, so now will friends and family members be a part of the party that will martyr God's saints in the last days. Yes. That's yes. Luke 21, mm -hmm. verse 12 through verse 16. Am I ready? And notice in the book, Great Controversy, page 608, Sister White says that those who once rejoice in the truth, those who once professed the third angel's message, when Sabbath keepers, the faithful ones, are brought before the courts, they will be our most bitterest foes. So we're not talking about those who now, if they remain, are joining in this ecumenism or those that are pushing the LGBT no. agenda. We're talking no, about Hillary. those yes. who have professed faith yes. in the third angel. Yes. That could be you. That could be me if we're not consecrated. Yes. And like you said, if we're not beholding Christ daily, momentarily, this will be us. We'll be on that side. And since you emphasize that, if we are having a daily walk with God now, we won't stand then. Look at Jerome. When Jerome heard that Hoss was captured, his love for his friend. He wanted to run to his he, aid. No, he ran to his aid. And when he realized he was up against a power greater than himself, humanly speaking, he, be, he began to retrace his steps, but they caught him brought Jerome to the courts. And when he was tried, he was condemned also to the stake. And they asked him, will you recant or do you want to be burned at the stake? And we are told Jerome recanted. And this is after he had spent about a year, approximately a year he, in prison. He, he recanted. Mm -hmm. He recanted. He recanted. And look at this on page 111. Paragraph one, Sister White says, watch carefully, friends, watch carefully. Let me find that statement. She says here, Jerome's attitude, Jerome's fortitude gave way and he consented to submit to the council. He pledged himself to adhere to the Catholic faith and condemned Wycliffe, condemned Haas, what would, be the what would be the application? If the man's fortitude gave way, it sounds to me that Jerome's faith failed. Faltered, yes. Mm -hmm. The man's faith failed. Watch carefully. He says now, I believe, it says, he pledged himself to adhere to the Catholic faith wow. what would be the application when wow. men today give up the sabbath mm. and accept sunday mercy the eucharist 
and other abominable teachings. And denounce the writings of Ellen White, denounce yes, former yes, brethren yes, that they yes, labored yes. with. But and who was Jerome before this? A, he was once a champion of the faith. What is God saying to us in this chapter, Hus and Jerome? I'll tell you, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Jesus says, let him that thinketh he stand. Take heed. Lest he falls. Take heed lest he falls. You know, Pastor, as you mentioned, the comparison between John Huss and how he typified Stephen's experience. We see here that Jerome's experience mirrors that of Peter. Because That's in the it. hour of crisis, Peter's faith failed. In the hour, even though Christ told him, you're Watch going this. to betray me. You're going to deny me thrice. Look at this here. In GC 1.12. Notice how the chapter painted the picture of the dungeon. Jerome protested against such cruelty and injustice. You have held me shut up 340 days in a frightful prison, in the midst of filth, noisomeness, stench, and the utmost want of everything. Next paragraph, 114 paragraph two, he says, what? Do you suppose that I fear to die? You have held me for a whole year in a frightful dungeon more horrible than death itself. Then he says, and my flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive. Do you see what's coming for us in the last days? The man's faith failed. But when Jerome found himself back in prison, mm. And he began to contemplate what Christ did for him, what Christ went through for him. When he began to recount the writings of Wycliffe and what Wycliffe went through and how he stood firm when he began to remember the words and the ministry of his dear friend John Haas, he said, no, I want to stand for God. And when he was brought back to the courts now. What a marked difference. Oh, my friends. Wow. Did he recant? No, he, the only recantation God's he made, saying. he recanted for having recanted the first time. And he said of all the sins that he had ever committed in his whole life, none of them weighed more heavily upon him than that first recantation. Because they brought oh. him back to make further recantations after the first. But he dared not. So just as, just as Huss mirrored in experience the life of Stephen, Stephen right. so Jerome mm -hmm. mirrors the experience of, of Peter. Peter. Because notice that Christ warned Peter, what was coming? Tonight the shepherd mm -hmm. shall be smitten. Mm -hmm. The sheep shall scatter. And what did Peter say? No, I'm going to stand for you. Right. But when the crisis came, what did Peter do? Denied Jesus. Three times. Three times. Three times. And notice. It was not until Peter now went back to where Gethsemane. The place he was sleeping before. And prayed. And, and wept oh, bitterly. Yes, yes. Wept. Did he have God to sorrow for sin? Yes, he did. And, and then when he was brought back to that similar test, what happened now? He stood as a great champion yes. of the faith. Huss, Stephen, mm -hmm. Jerome, Peter. And God is saying to us, Make sure we are found watching and praying now. That's right. Put away pride, boastfulness, lest we will fall. Friends, human strength will not make it in the last days. No. Jerome is a witness of that. We need spiritual strength now to stand. Amen. And I was just going to say, and during this final crisis, we're not going to have the opportunity that um, Jerome had and that Peter had to go back to Gethsemane, as it were, and to pray and weep bitterly. Once we make that decision, it's irrevocable. It cannot be changed. And so we now need to have the experience of beholding Christ daily, the experience of watchfulness and praying in Gethsemane, seeing Christ's agony, as it were. Reading the scenes, meditating daily, as we're told to do in the desire of ages, and letting that word transform us and sanctify us. You know, friends, us. I hope these words are clear to our minds. On page 114, we are told the experience of Jerome when he came forward. They were about 
They place him on the, on the stake. Faggots under his feet. Wood. The same spot that John same Huss, spot. the very spot that John Huss had yielded up his now, life. They were about to light the faggots from behind him. And he said, oh no. Come to my face. Right. Light the fire. Let me see it. If I were afraid to be, if I were afraid, I would not even be here. Oh. Come forward boldly. Mm, mm, mm. I want that power. Wow. And friends, this, I mean, do, do, do you want this power? This must be what we crave. Mm -hmm. This is the faith of Jesus. Yes. And just as uh, Jerome manifested such boldness, don't stay behind me and do it. Come, come to my it face. my face. And when they lit the faggots, and he began to burn. Just imagine the smell of charred flesh, skin. Just imagine the smoke just going heavenward. Listen to me. That was an altar of sacrifice. Yes, yes it was. And they, were a li they were a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. And just as John Huss was singing as he was being burned at the stake, on Jerome's way, it said he went singing but as he was actually being burned prayers he was praying audibly and you could still hear the prayers and they said while he was burning you could still see his lips moving what was occupying their mind not anger not vengeance not take me down off of this stake no they were praying they were singing they were reflecting on Christ did he learn to pray then no friends just like then did we learn did he learn to pray then no no friends no, no. And that, and what God is showing me, two things. Number one, the songs they sang by God's help and God's grace became the antidote to the pain. Mm -hmm. The prayers that they prayed became that spiritual antidote to the physical pain. They were numb to it, as it were. And what God is saying to us, as we go through daily crises, trials, it's these songs of Zion. The hymns, the scripture songs, that will become the spiritual antidote to our pain. Mm -hmm. It's this time spent in prayer, praying the word of God, that will become that spiritual antidote. If we don't have this experience now, we will not get it then. And when you look at the altar, Hus was on the altar. Jerome was on the altar. Do you see how God works? Even the wicked made an altar that day, my friends. Mm. And that altar did not begin then. Their whole lives manifested that they were a living sacrifice. Amen. And how they lived, that was how they ended the experience. Wow. And just as Jerome said those words, my mind went back to Peter. Mm -hmm. Because when they grabbed Peter and they were about to crucify Peter for the faith, they placed Peter on the cross upside down just as the wicked did a few years before with Christ no right side up they right yeah right right side up right and Peter said no 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 I'm not even worthy to die like my Savior mm. turn me upside down what a death my friends and that's how Peter died on the altar what God is saying to us, that sanctuary, we have to live on the altar if we are going to be a living sacrifice in these last days. Let's close right here. On these statements we read, in the book, The Desire of Ages, page 354, Hillary, The Disciples. The disciples were not endowed with the courage and fortitude of the martyrs until such grace was needed. Then the Savior's promise was fulfilled. What does that mean? So not until it is needed will we receive it. But we must now live in, in anticipation that if it's God's will for us to be martyrs, right. then we are ready. And not in self-sufficiency, saying like Peter said, because that led him to fall, but read, being humble. Yes. Read that statement here. Our high calling, page 125, Paragraph four, just the first two lines. 
We will not be able to meet the trials of this time without God. We are not to have the courage and fortitude of martyrs of old until brought into the position they were in. Is it coming again? Yes. Notice now. Let's, let's skip on over. It says here, skip on down to Ministry of Healing, page 502. Hillary, bottom paragraph. There is a picture representing a bullock standing between a plow and an altar with the inscription, ready for either, ready to toil in the furrow or to be offered on the altar of sacrifice. This is the position of the true child of God, willing to go where duty calls, to deny self, to sacrifice for the Redeemer's cause. So this must be whose position? Our position. That means our children must have this position. Our, our nieces, nephews, bring them into this spiritual position. Our sales must be brought into this position, whether the plow or the altar, whichever one. So we need an experience. If God says work, live longer, praise him. If he says, you will be a martyr for me, praise God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, Paul wrote, I die daily. Amen. And as we live a life of self-denial by God's grace, surrendering sins, obeying God's Ten Commandments, having our devotion, studying and sharing God's word, singing these hymns, these scripture songs, praying back these scriptures, we'll be ready for the last days. Amen. Friends, I want to be made ready. How about you? How do you feel this evening? Were you enriched? Amen. Were you strengthened? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this experience in this chapter, Huss and Jerome, Huss, Stephen, Jerome, Peter, Constance, let us hear the schism, then root out heresy. October 31st, 2017, an ecumenical council again to heal the deadly wound, to heal the schism, one step closer to the complete healing of that deadly wound of the papacy. The next step, to identify heretics and root them out. Lord God of heaven, we want to be found ready. We want the true experience of us, of Jerome, for ourselves, for our children. We want to be made ready. And this can only be done daily. We want to please you. We do not want to deny you. We do not want to recant. And we're so glad today. The promise you gave to Peter is also for us. Simon, Simon, Satan desires that he may have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Dear God, thank you for your prayers, but we know what duty is. Save us, please. Prepare Seventh-day Adventists to stand as the true painters and not to be erasing the contrast between Christ and the Antichrist. Let your people be found faithful. Let there be no Judas Iscariot among us. Now, dear God, prepare us for heaven. Even for next week, by your grace, as we move into chapter 7 of the book, Great Controversy. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, friends, again, we want to thank you for joining us for our service this evening. By God's grace, we will resume on next Thursday. For our next chapter, I believe it is Luther that we'll be studying on chapter 7. Let's read the chapter so we can come back and by way of review, study and make other startling personal applications. Please join us this coming Sabbath at 11.30 a.m. God bless until we meet again.